All right. So just wanted to say a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Keely Roth, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society Inspire, Develop, Empower, and Advance Committee. So that is our diversity and inclusion committee as part of GRSS. And I'm joined today by my co-chair, Sean Kefauver, and one of our lead members, Heather McNairn. And we're really excited to welcome you all to uh, this year's virtual format as part of the IGARS Technology Industry and Education Track Forum. So uh, we'll be keeping everyone muted during the session. You'll notice that you're not able to unmute yourself. And so we encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions. Um, today, our agenda looks a little bit like um, this opening section. We're going to turn it over to Sean, who's going to give a brief update on IDEA Committee's activities for the year, uh, sort of our annual update. And then we'll transition over to our fireside chat. So we have three wonderful panelists that have joined us today, uh, Christine Walker, Athena Petropoulou, and Nisha Ramakrishnan. And we're going to have some uh, moderated Q&A that I'll be leading. And then we'll also open it up for audience questions. And what we'd really like to do today is have a candid conversation around how do you set up and measure the success of diversity and inclusion initiatives in a technical society like GRSS. And so really excited to hear the perspectives from our panelists. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in that chat panel. Um, and we should be uh, able to check in with folks. I think Heather is going to keep keep an eye on that that box during um, during the part of that we're talking, and then she'll also moderate those questions when we get to the audience Q and A portion. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Sean to give our annual update on Idea Committee activities. Sean. Okay, thank you, Keely. Um, so I've got a, a fairly short, um, a boring presentation about some really exciting things that we've been doing that, um, that I, I hope you will be inspired by the ideas uh, more than my slides. So I'll, and there's just a couple of slides uh, just to make things easier for me. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second and then we'll go back to talking, okay? So here it is. Share presentation. Okay. Uh, presentation. There we go. Okay, so um, we are the Inspire, Develop, Empower, and Advance uh, Committee of GRSS, a part of IEEE. And, um, and this is some of the activities we're doing. We have to, um, to thank Mariko for giving us the great acronym and, and getting us going a couple of years ago and, and then handing it over to us once it was fully functioning already. So um, this is actually building on the work of a lot of people that came before us. This is uh, some of the committee members here, uh, Alina, Fairuz, Heather, uh, Mariko, Nekaruka, NK, and Chian, uh, Keely and myself. And then also, um, I haven't got a picture for Natalia here. I know she has pictures on the internets around there, but I wanted to get one that she approves of before I put it in the presentation. I don't know if I missed anybody. We tried to up up, um, updated as we go along. Um, idea initiatives uh, for 2020. Um, we're really pushing to advance the women mentoring women program. Um, we did uh, requested internal funding for that, and, and we're launching a social media um, package to expand the presence of that and, and hopefully recruit new people to participate in that. We think it's a great program that could be a great benefit to, to both senior and junior and, and starting up members. Uh, we have a quarterly column in the Geoscience Remote Sensing Magazine, um, which we uh, push to meet those deadlines to highlight activities that we're leading, that other people are leading, um, and other different themes about women in geoscience and remote sensing. While IDEA has sort of expanded to a broader concept of diversity and inclusion, the uh, Geoscience Remote Sensing Magazine has for the most part stayed within um, Women in Geoscience Remote Sensing. Um, this is our conversion of the IGARS Women in Geoscience Remote Sensing Forum and Luncheon 
to two online events that Keeley has done a great job of organizing. We've also worked on TRSS events code of conduct and uh, parents resource list to try to improve things uh, for families in science, for parents in science, and, and for people who are coming um, with their loved ones to try to uh, keep their career uh, in balance with their lives. Um, we're also working on my son with uh, the Women in Engineering, which is a larger, broader society or grouping of societies within IEEE. And, um, and also in collaboration with NK, who is our Africa liaison, to try to expand our presence there. New, we've been testing out a microgrants pilot program and also professional development grants for young minorities when pursuing advanced degrees. Um, we test that out supporting the regional GRSS conferences um, that were planned for Tunisia, Chile, and India. Um, Tunisia was a great success. Chile and India, I think, uh, are both gone all virtual or completely canceled due to the global pandemic. Um, and we're working on um, looking at diversity and nominations and awards groups as well. So some highlights. Um, here, I would like to highlight the event that we're hosting today. It's, um, without saying, we also have another one coming up. Um, some of our recent work in the magazine column, I think, has been talking up our initiatives and also uh, generating some conversation points about uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, the social media package, and the, and the microgrants. So the Women in GRSS Forum um, is normally an in-person activity. Uh, we have a panel of speakers, we discuss these things, and so this is turned into a global uh, virtual event with Globe, Wise E, uh, focusing on Inspire and Empower, which will be uh, Thursday, October 29th, I hope I get that right, and is going to include part of our Women in Geoscience photo contest. So I don't know if you've heard about that, but you might want to check it out. Here's the link. Um, and also the Women in GRSS luncheon, um, uh, which is this happening right now, our diversity fireside chat. Uh, this is some of our Geoscience Remote Sensing Magazine issues. June just came out. Uh, it seems so far away. But um, in the September one, um, I th think is out as well, or it's coming. Um, sometimes I, I get lost in the publishing deadlines. December is coming up. Actually, we should be writing that now. But we're going to go for the late deadline and try to include some summary of, of these activities and conversations. The Women Mentoring Women program. So we applied for some internal funding through GRSS and hit the jackpot. So we've um, selected uh, um, a group of company um, to do a promotional social media package, including spots for social media, really short pieces, medium pieces. And actually we ended up going with one who said that they would, they would throw a podcast in. Um, as part of a, an added benefit. So, um, so we're really excited, really, really excited about our podcast and the videos and the, the discussions that it's going to uh, encourage. Um, um, there'll also be some virtual adaptations to that, but uh, we're really excited about it. Um, this was uh, our micro grants. So we tested them out. It was supposed to be in the beginning supporting uh, attendance of these regional IGARS conferences, which were an IGARS outreach to diversity, uh, geographical diversity. Um, and then a lot of that was shut down, so we're shifting and trying to find a way to provide uh, support for virtual events or digital opportunities, um, such attendance of online events or training opportunities um, that will fit within the same sort of structure of funding that we had set up. And that's all actually. Uh, thank you for everybody on the committee for the really hard work and for the uh, vice chair and, and president of GRSS for supporting us. Thanks, John. If anyone in the audience, uh, feel free if you have questions around any of the initiatives that we're working on to drop, uh, drop that into the group chat. And we have a few extra minutes, so we can we can field a few of those questions now, if there are any. And if not, then we'll we'll move on. All right. 
right. Ob obligatory awkward waiting has happened. Do feel free if you think of another of a question to go ahead and, and put it in that and we'll, uh, we'll come back to that at the end. But I'll go ahead and take this opportunity to transition us over to our fireside chat. I think it's great. More time to have these conversations is, is always better in my mind. Um, and so we'll, we'll kick this off by giving each of our three panelists uh, five minutes or so just to give an introduction to themselves, talk a little bit about their experience in the diversity and inclusion space, and in particular highlight some of the activities that they're currently involved in. Um, so I will start um, with our first panelist, Dr. Athena Petropoulou, who's a distinguished professor at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Rutgers. She's also an IEEE fellow uh, and has been a distinguished lecturer for both the Signal Processing Society and the Aerospace and Electronics Systems Society. So Athena, I will hand it over to you for a five minute intro. Yes, hello everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to be on this panel. I'm very impressed with uh, the IDEA program activities um, and I took notes of some of your activities. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a faculty at Rutgers. Uh, my research area is uh, signal processing. I'm originally Greek. I came to the US in 1986 for graduate school and I stayed uh, since then. Um, I'm also president-elect of the IEEE Signal Processing Society, and I will be president in 2022. I'm passionate about diversity and inclusion. If we look at uh, the US and electrical engineering in particular, uh, only 11% of the undergraduate students are uh, female or underrepresented minorities. If you look at the graduate level, it's a little bit better, but not much better. Um, Similarly, if you look at the faculty, uh, minorities are uh, underrepresented. Low diversity numbers in our student body translates into low diversity numbers in the workforce, which means that the workforce is missing out on talent needed to address the complex challenges of our world. And um, research shows that uh, uh, the low numbers on the faculty, um, actually research shows that uh, uh, the presence of uh, diversity on the faculty encourages more diversity uh, in the student body. And um, for, for that reason, um, I have focused on increasing the number of diversity um, faculty in US institutions. Uh, between 2010 and 2016, I was uh, um, chair of my department. And in 2015, I became the president of the ECE Department Heads Association, which is a body that addresses the chairs of all ECE departments. And in that capacity, I started a program that they called it I Redefine, um, uh, which is an acronym. Uh, basically, I redefine the double E, uh, to become more um, diverse. Uh, the, the focus of the program was to increase, uh, to motivate and prepare students to consider academic careers. So we designed a workshop, uh, the I Redefine workshop that was held uh, uh, together with the AC Department Heads Association annual meeting. And that workshop um, prepared and motivated students to apply for uh, academic positions. Uh, the program is still going on. Um, in the two years that I oversaw it, uh, it uh, involved uh, 66 students. And as of last June, 36% of those students have pursued academic positions. And I was very encouraged by that finding. Uh, now in my position as uh, the um, president-elect of the Signal Processing Society, I propose to launch this at a much large, larger scale, to launch this at the international level. So um, my proposal was accepted and the Signal Browsing Society will have a, a workshop as part, permanent part of the two largest conferences of the Signal Browsing Society, which is the ICASP conference and the ICIP conference. So the first uh, workshop, we call the workshop Progress. It's an acronym 
that stands for um, increasing diversity in, in academia. And uh, we will launch the first progress workshop at the ICIP conference, International Conference on Image Processing, um, on October 26 and 27. Uh, so far, we have uh, 200 uh, registered students for, from all over the world, and we will uh, uh, address these students, we'll try to mo motivate them, we'll, fi we'll have faculty sharing experiences, uh, hopefully to motivate students, that uh, uh, academic uh, positions are uh, very exciting. Um, we'll have a professional training company, help them how to negotiate and best present themselves, um, when they go for an interview um, and, and, and so on. Um, and I look forward to that because uh, it's going to be uh, at an international level, we'll get to hear from panelists from all over the world and we, we compare notes and uh, uh, best practices on how diversity is seen uh, around the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sophia. Uh, and I'll introduce our, our next panelist, uh, Nisha Ramakrishnan, who is the co-founder and CEO of Occlusion Inc. Uh, Nisha is a DEI strategist and founder who has over 17 years of experience working in technology industry. Uh, so Nisha, we'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and your efforts in the area of diversity and inclusion. Nisha, you're muted still. Typical technical challenges. <laughs> it's what happens in remote meetings all the time, right? So um, I wanted to say, first of all, Keely, uh, Sean, and Heather, I really appreciate you organizing these conversations. They're so important and so meaningful. Um, and I do appreciate the opportunity to be invited to this panel and to speak with everyone. Um, this particular topic is all the more important to me because I feel like you know, we have made strides in terms of diversity and inclusion programs and strategies and things like that. But I think we are reaching that turning point where we need to be able to bring the right types of tools and avenues and opportunities to really measure the success of these programs. Um, and also see like, what do we need to do with this data to improve on the programs that already exist or bring new programs um, into this space. And with everything going on in the world, I think these conversations are all the more important. Um, so hi everyone, as every, uh, Keely mentioned earlier, um, I do have over 17 years of experience, mostly in the technology space, a little bit in the banking sector as well, um, working with Microsoft, HSBC, uh, Bayer, Climate Corporation, and several different types of role, ranging from you know, being a developer to being a operations head to being a program head to managing technical programs and then also to most recently before starting my company being the chief of staff to the CTO and head of product um, at the Climate Corporation. And what I've tried to do through most of my career is that, you know, like we have job descriptions, right? All of the roles that I've been in have very specific job descriptions. And not a lot of that is like specifically focused on, you know, initiatives that you take on on your own in your career to make your workplace is more inclusive. So what I've tried to do is tie in data that I have, you know, constantly researched and studied and sort of build within my job description um, additional avenues that I can contribute to to make my teams more inclusive in general. And over 17 years, I've had so much um, I've enjoyed doing that so much and I've enjoyed the challenge of doing that so much from a not so DNI influential position that eventually I wanted to make it a full time thing that even without influence, you can bring so much of inclusion in the workplace, you can truly move the needle when it comes to the, these types of programs and organizations are listening and willing to learn and all that experience that I've gained in 17 years today, I want to make it full time. I want to really try to build something that, you know, makes an impact. And I wanted to take all of my technical experience and marry that with organic conversations in the workplace to try to bring more success to these initiatives. And that's why me and uh, my husband, who's also on this call, Nathan, uh, co-founded the company Occlusion. And what we're trying to do is basically we're trying to create AI driven software that intercepts bias and in non-inclusive 
um, events as they happen on remote calls. Um, as you know, the world is moving so much towards this hybrid model of like working remotely and like, you know, it's becoming more of a global uh, working environment that these kind of events can happen more often and be addressed a lot lesser. So we're trying to create software that can live intercept these on calls and at the same time also discreetly coach the people who are engaged in those kind of activities. But then we don't stop there. What we try to do is pull this data through these calls and then provide an individual and company level dashboard where you can see the incidents that you've kind of been engaged in. Uh, it also gives you like a score based on your inclusive behaviors and things like that. And then also kind of gives you certain suggestions and coaching on your dashboard itself. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do is that one thing that like, you know, which I obviously focus on all the time while de developing a strategy is some method of accountability. And we are trying to build that into our software as well, where it rounds it up with coaching based on the exact type of incidents you're engaged in um, so that you have re coaches that are specialized in correcting those kind of behaviors, work with you more individually um, and sort of help you overcome those in a very non-punitive, engaging, manner so that everybody feel like people are not threatened by wanting to change by wanting to improve by wanting to get more familiar with these circumstances they're in fact encouraged and enjoy that accountability so i i mean this has been my dream to build something like this it's been my dream to bring this to workplaces and we're at that stage where we are prototyping and we are you know presenting it to tons of people so it's an exciting phase um, in our careers. And my partner is just like that too, equally passionate and engaged in the community uh, for all of these types of initiatives. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thanks so much, Nisha. And I will introduce our third panelist, uh, Christine Walker, who is the Assistant Deputy Minister for the Corporate Management Branch uh, and is the Chief Financial Officer as well at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, Christine, welcome to the panel and, and please give us your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm, I, this initiative is I'm very, very excited about it, and I, I really applaud you for starting um, uh, the initiative. Um, I'm also very happy to be here for two very accomplished women as well, so a pleasure to meet you, Athena and Nisha, virtually. Um, so Agriculture Canada, Agri-Food Canada has 5,500 employees. We have a budget of about $3, uh, $3 billion. And I'm very, very pleased to say that we have been um, uh, nominated and uh, as part of top 100 companies for diversity in Canada for the last seven years. So um, that, that doesn't mean that we stop though. Um, as part of my corporate management role, I have finance, human resources, I have real property, security, corporate planning. We, our branch touches every single employee in the organization. And I feel that we're very well positioned to be able to drive change in terms of uh, diversity. Um, interestingly enough, I started off in engineering and ended up in finance and my first jobs were all computer programming. And um, What's interesting is throughout my career, I've had a mix of uh, this mix of kind of engineering and finance has allowed me to be both CIO and CFO in a number of my roles. And I've worked in many different industries, including aerospace, technology, manufacturing, uh, um, the government um, in both uh, banking, um, uh, CETA, which is the international aid. I worked for Canadian Border Services. Uh, and now I'm working for Agriculture Canada. I even worked for a luxury travel company in France for five years. Um, and throughout that, you know, uh, it took, you'd had to overcome adversity because, you know, it was not easy at the start, especially in engineering and entering uh, and being a female in aerospace industry, even Canadian Border Services, which is mostly male and very much a police organization. Um, it was, it wasn't difficult, but it was different, I would say. Um, AFC uh, is really doing a lot uh, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion. And we're not, we don't want to stand on our laurels to the because of the fact that we've been able to be in the top 100. 
Um, we have, uh, I'm the champion along with my co-champion Vidya for all of our diversity networks. So we have five of them. We have an Indigenous uh, Women in Science, which Heather is uh, well aware of. We have the Visible Minorities. We have LGBTQ and um, as well, we have a persons with disabilities. Every single one of those networks has network champions and our responsibility is to support those networks to make sure that we can bring the networks together and learn from each other and have common, um, common uh, goals and common um, uh, opportunities to engage. Um, I will say we also have a sort of very small and mighty team in our HR department that actually supports them. Uh, I would say that for the Canadian government, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, really when I get to some of the questions, but um, it really starts at the top. Our prime minister basically made the decision that his entire cabinet would be half women and half men. Also, he made sure that there was an indigenous and there was a visible minorities presence in his cabinet, which is a powerful statement coming from the leader of our country. Also, our deputy, uh, um, Chris Forbes is very passionate about this and just recently uh, had met and our deputies like the CEO had met with the uh, all of the networks and talked to them and asked how they were doing in COVID. He also asked what are the things, how can we help them? And uh, we're having another discussion about diversity uh, at, um, with those networks and he's going to do a one-on-one -on -one with those networks just to, to listen and find out how he can help and how he can help support these, uh, these networks and the people that are part of those networks in the organization. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, very interested to listen to uh, both of my colleagues on the phone and uh, on the virtual phone, I guess. And uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the session. Thank you so much, Christine. So we're going to move into uh, some pre-planned Q and A. I see, I think the couple, couple of comments there. Folks, just in general, asking about topics we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a lot uh, with our panelists about the differences in how they've interacted with diversity and inclusion as, as part of their career tracks. Uh, but we're also going to try to focus in specifically on what makes certain initiatives work and how you can really set yourself up for success. Um, one of the key goals that the IDEA Committee wants to come from this event is a little bit more focus and a better plan for helping us really measure the impact of the initiatives that we support through the IDEA program. So the conversation we'll move to now will, will hopefully let us delve in on those topics a little bit more deeply. If you have questions in the audience, please feel free to put those in the uh, group chat we will have an open time period for audience Q&A uh, that we'll moderate after, after some of these um, pre-planned questions. So I'll get started on that. Uh, Christine, my first question is to you. In your role championing diversity and inclusion in government's programs, you have a kind of unique position at the connection between scientists, industry, and decision-making within the government. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you see the role of government in this space and what are some of the commonalities in challenges or efforts that you've seen across the different groups that you work with? Thank you, Keely. Um, I really see the role as government is bringing all the stakeholders together to ensure that any barriers for equity seeking groups or accessing employment programs, funding, etc., are addressed and decisions that are made in the interest of all these stakeholders. So a good example is we actually have a grant um, a program um, to uh, invest in women in agriculture. That program specifically de designed, the only applicants can be women and, um, and we support them in the agricultural sector. Uh, there another way that the government is doing it and they're embedding it in their policies. For example, there are some government policies that say for certain uh, requests for proposals for contracts, you have to have a certain percentage of women on the board of your organization. So by using policy, they're able to uh, change and kind of force change to a certain extent. Each um, each uh, department has a departmental audit committee and on the departmental audit committees, representation 
on those audit committees. They're, they're forced, forcing, they're ensuring that we have adequate representation from women, from people with visible minorities, and the other, um, and the other uh, areas in terms of indigenous to, indigenous to make sure that uh, we are being properly, rep the uh, different groups are being properly uh, represented. On top of that, we have targets for ec uh, employment equity programs. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, targets for indigenous persons with disabilities, uh, visible minorities and women. I'd be happy to say that overall in agriculture, we have more women than we do men. Um, I think there still needs some work in the science side, but uh, you know, it's a start. Um, finally, I would say that uh, one of the other areas that I really think that we have to focus on is we can have the targets. We have a actually government-wide survey that employees can respond to. We have other surveys that within our department that people can respond to in terms of challenges in terms of diversity or how they're feeling, how a certain group is feeling. We had uh, a mental health check and if you were part of um, one of our uh, employment equity groups or LGBTQ, how did you feel, right? So we're making sure that we're embedding that in our surveys and always asking the questions of all employees and also focusing on how can we help and, and what would help, um, help people uh, work better. I would say that there's still a long ways to go. Um, I would, we need to change the culture in the organization and that's going to take time and it's going to take effort. And I believe somebody mentioned accountability and it's, it's about manager accountability. We have to hold the managers to account to also embrace diversity and inclusion in every part of their work too. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Kristen. Um, next question I have is, is for Nisha. So in, in your career, you mentioned you've had a diversity of roles and you've really kind of thought about how do you, how do you pull d &I in as part of those different roles? And as you think about your, your new endeavor and really helping companies design and measure their d &I programs, where do you think about starting? Uh, how, do you, how does a company or a society, what information do they need to have to really set themselves up to have a successful set of initiatives around diversity and inclusion? Great. Thank you, Keely. Um, so I think I would like to start with a point that Christine made earlier um, in her um, in her response around policy, because I think that's where a lot of it begins. Like, you know, at, at times you do have to bring policies in place that encourage uh, bringing in the right type of diversity and inclusion within a company. But for me, where it really starts is doing a thorough and honest investigation of the company's existing or organization's existing policies and practices, whether it's their recruiting practices, whether what are the avenues available for employees to confidentially be able to share if they're being, you know, feel, feeling discriminated against or feeling disadvantaged in certain situations. And if they have done so, then what are the policies you have in place to address that kind of stuff and um, have employees like have candid conversations with randomly picked employees to see how they're feeling. It's not just about inclusion. Do they feel like they belong where they work? So having an honest assessment of this stuff and then also understanding the demographic makeup of uh, the leadership teams, you know, um, is really, really important to me. But the next step after that for me is also that okay, well, I have all this data, I do need to understand what is the leadership team's appetite to have these honest conversations and really understand these honest um, inputs that their employees have provided. You know, like sometimes when you talk to them, you realize that there are certain words, there are certain terminologies and certain statements that make them uncomfortable. And so you get a good idea of the type of strategy that they would have an appetite for and what type of changes that are they comfortable with and what can we really work with. Um, the other really important thing, this is also part of the starting point for me, is to really understand a company's why. Like, why do you want to become more inclusive? It, it may be an obvious answer um, if you ask for it that way, but what's the next layer? Is it just so you can protect your company from scandals or lawsuits and things like that? Or do you really think by making certain changes, you can move the needle within the company to make it more inclusive and improve people's, you know, people of color and their tenure within the companies? What is your why? 
why to do this, because that is what will give us the true motivation of the type of change we can bring um, in an organization. And the third thing, which honestly, um, like, you know, after all this, I feel like it can be woven into everything is that you want companies to work with some type of data, like discrimination happens every day, right, in some form or some capacity. And it's hard to really track when it's happening and hard to really work with what's happening and really solve something unless you have meaningful data to look at and work with and measure your success after using that data. So I think that is something companies should invest in to be able to successfully design programs for themselves or bring external consultants to develop that. Um, but at the same time, also try to look at, you know, technology out there that helps intercept some of this real time. Of course, HR or managers or even like, you know, evangelists who are really interested in this space cannot sit in every meeting that happens. But technology can work with you because technology is with you all the time. And when bias it comes into play or discrimination comes into play, it's a very real time event. Like, you know, you can recollect data later, but it's a very real time event. And if you can intercept and get into that conversation then and try to fix some of the stuff, I feel like it could bring some meaningful change and it could help people be more aware um, and try to change things. So I think companies should invest in quality data, meaningful data to understand what's going on, um, work with technology um, in the space. And the third thing is never stop having important conversations, organic conversations on everything that's happening around the world, not just when the Black Lives Matter movement is at its peak. Have those kind of conversations all the time about how people are feeling about all the events happening around the world. I think those are some ways we can set ourselves up for success. Uh, next question is for Athena. You mentioned your uh, participation in and really getting going the progress program and, and you mentioned kind of bridging that over from academia into the signal processing society. So could you tell us a little bit more about how efforts like the progress program around diversity and inclusion might look different in technical professional societies than in academia? Are they really facing the same challenges? Are there ways that you feel will need to adapt programs like progress to really help them be successful uh, in, in IEEE programs? Thank you, Kelly. This is a very interesting uh, question. So um, I can talk about uh, the professional IEEE, which is my, my professional society. And um, it's, IEEE well accepts that uh, innovation uh, requires the talents of uh, diverse uh, people, people from diverse perspectives and backgrounds. And uh, there are many activities to promote uh, diversity. The problem with a professional society is that they address an international audience. And the term diversity is not well defined everywhere. Like in the US, we define it as women and underrepresented minority, black students, uh, Hispanic students, um, and so on. How do you talk about diversity, uh, about underrepresentation of colored people in, um, in Africa, for example? It, it's difficult to have a common message of what diversity is. Um, so it's easier to focus on women only. That's why women are underrepresented everywhere in the world. So um, you don't run the risk of uh, uh, further the need for further clarification. Um, so we see IEEE has uh, co committees for women in uh, um, signal processing, women in electrical engineering, and, and so on. Uh, the professional societies try to address the membership and they want to offer better opportunities for the members. They want to help them network uh, and so on. Uh, but, uh, and, and of course they want to expand, uh, but uh, there is a small pool to begin with. So they cannot uh, significantly expand unless they branch out to K-12 to audiences or to the public. And this is an activity that uh, educational institutions undertake, these uh, outreach activities. They try to encourage students, um, maybe K to 12 uh, ages, to consider uh, electrical engineering as a profession. Uh, or they try to uh, educate the public of what, of what electrical engineers do so that they can talk to their kids and maybe steer them towards uh, 
electrical engineering. Uh, so uh, educational institutions, at least in the US that I'm familiar with, are very committed in improving diversity. And they have uh, many um, uh, activities towards that front. They have policies. Um, faculty take training, video training, on how to treat uh, diversity. Um, uh, recruitment committees, search committees are trained on how to identify diversity and uh, um, uh, hire diversity. Um, how to, uh, there are scholarships and funding opportunities for a diversity faculty and students. Um, I'm not sure how um, this is uh, accepted around the world, how, uh, how uh, universities in other countries care about increasing uh, diversity or if they have activities. And uh, I think the professional societies can play this role to let us know because they have this international platform, they can let us know what kind of activities are going on around the world. So we can compare notes and, um, and maybe uh, try ideas that uh, we never thought of. For example, um, we here in the US, we're trying to increase the number of uh, females in our undergraduate programs in electrical engineering. If, if you look at China, uh, they have 50% are females in undergraduate programs. Similarly, in India, this doesn't mean that uh, their graduate students uh, have high percentages uh, of females, and uh, also their faculty do not have high percentage of uh, of females. So, what does it mean to have all male faculty educating uh, female students? Will they give them? the attention that they deserve, uh, even if they have the best intentions, maybe they're not well equipped to encourage them to become leaders in their field. Uh, um, so we, we need to understand all this and uh, the professional societies can play this role, help us understand this. Thank you. That's, I, I really, I love the calling out of this kind of unique role that um, the societies under a group like IEEE might have in building a, a better global sense of what diversity and inclusion is. My next question is, is going to be for each panelist. So same question, would like to hear from, from all of you. Uh, and it's when you think about an individual program or initiative focused on diversity inclusion, how do you think about measuring success? And could you share an example from your experience of a success you've been a part of and, and maybe also one that it has, you could call a failure or one that maybe didn't didn't have the impact you originally hoped it might. Um, maybe Christine, we can start with you. You are muted. Christine. Thank you. Um, very good question. So um, I think that uh, you know, we've had success with some and, and not as much success as we would have liked with others, I would say. Um, one of the ones that we did have success with, and it um, was uh, under uh, the chief scientist, it was Brian Gray at the time, uh, really wanted to invest in indigenous, um, indigenous uh, kind of science and STEM. And one of the things that uh, he had done is uh, with a small team set up Indigenous Student Recruitment Initiative. Why? If we can start starting um, getting the students into agriculture and into our organization in the government of Canada, you're able to, uh, they don't have to formally apply for a job. You can just what we call bridge them in so they can come in every summer. And if they're doing really great, we can just say, great, we want to offer you a job. So. Um, that was, first of all, you had an executive leader that had tremendous amount of passion. Um, they were well resourced to be able to execute the work that they wanted to execute. Um, they also, it was indigenous employees who led the way the whole time. So it was them that were driving the change. And uh, we, we did have uh, metrics to track and, and see how we did. Unfortunately, I don't have the metrics with us, but we did. And then they also, once the recruits were hired, they were provided mentorship and support throughout their time there. And as a result, um, many of those um, 
students are uh, now working with us. So I think that's a great success. And, you know, again, it started at the top. It was led by uh, individuals who were very passionate about it and were aware of the challenges in those communities. And uh, we were successful. Um, and in fact, now that student hiring, um, uh, the Indigenous Student Recruitment Group has now been moved to our HR because we want to be able to leverage um, and see how they did it and how we can use their knowledge uh, and expand on the recruiting just to be so we can bring in an enhanced um, student recruitment in some of the other areas. So I think that that is, is one of the good, one, uh, good ones. I would say one of the other, um, a piece of work that uh, was done uh, by, um, uh, by the, science, the science and technology branch was, was a focus on unconscious bias. And it was an excellent piece of work that was uh, presented, uh, done by uh, one of the scientists, presented to senior management, presented to the management teams. And I really feel that we haven't taken that uh, further. Um, a good, good examples is even the way we do our job descriptions. If we could write our job descriptions, as you already mentioned, Nisha, and our job posters, would we attract people differently? Because words matter. And I would say that's one, I think due to COVID, our unconscious bias, we have an unconscious bias course, it was delivered um, um, in person, is now gone, you know, uh, we have to make it virtual. So I would say that one is one that I really, we really want to pick up on that and, and drive that forward. Um, I would just say that, you know, there's no easy solutions. It's really, it has to come from the top and you have to have people who are passionate about it. And I think part of our job as senior leaders is, is developing that passion throughout the organization and to get the whole organization engaged rather than just a handful of a group of people. And I think that's, that's what I'm gonna do. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Athena, you wanna take this one? Uh, yes, so um, I would like to share uh, my, uh, my story, when I was uh, head of the EC department, uh, we tried uh, different ways to increase the diversity of our students. Um, our female representation was 11% in the undergraduate uh, program. So we uh, implemented uh, some policies to increase that. Um, so the main thing that we did was um, uh, we tried to address the first year, the freshman students, um, uh, uh, in my school, the first year students are all under the dean. They don't belong to departments. And uh, there is a course, it's a, the uh, orientation course that uh, um, different departments go there and present their departments, trying to convince the students to choose that department. By the end of the year, the students have to declare their uh, department. So typically, um, people, departments would send people to talk about logistics and course requirements and everything. Um, so uh, as chair, I saw an opportunity uh, in uh, attracting more female students to my department and uh, sent my most research active faculty to talk about the research. And in particular, I chose faculty who uh, did uh, uh, work related to uh, bioelectrical uh, engineering applications because female students tend to like uh, uh, work that has societal impact. Um, so this worked out very well. Um, after a uh, few years, our enrollment increased to 19%. Uh, our uh, uh, women enrollment increased to 19% from 11%. And uh, in addition to that, we got uh, the highest number of honor students. The department increased dramatically. Uh, so it worked uh, for uh, female students and also for uh, the gender student population. So I, I would think that this was a success story in increasing our, our uh, diversity in electrical engineering at Rutgers. Um, now, um, for the other end, I'm looking at IEEE, there is uh, this uh, commitment to foster diversity, but if you look at the, what's going on actually in uh, the various uh, activities, volunteer activities, you can see that uh, 
women and diversity are uh, underrepresented and under uh, um, recognized. You look at the committees, they do not have enough uh, diversity in them, volunteer committees. If you look at the recognition that um, people receive, very few women get awards, very few women are uh, parts of conference organizing committees, um, and so on. So um, in that sense, there is a lot more work that needs to be done to uh, make uh, what we have as a mission statement actual practice. And uh, what Nisa has been talking about, uh, looking at data and evaluating our efforts is really very important in uh, uh, building sustainable uh, activities, initiatives that will result in, in real change. We need to uh, constantly evaluate what we're doing, keep records of what we're doing and try to fine tune our efforts. Thank you, Athena. Nisha? Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think Athena and Christine both touched on a very uh, important part that I wanted to talk about as well is um, it's company, I think unconscious bias trainings and uh, those kind of efforts are very, very well intentioned, but data has shown that they're not as effective um, in truly transforming cultures because many a times it's like an hour of consultants coming into your company or a few hours of consultants coming into your company and talking about why un you know unconscious bias and eradicating that is important and trying to help people identify certain behaviors that are just non-inclusive but then that conversation doesn't continue it tends to stop there and sometimes it actually does more harm than good because you're coming out from a one-sided session with not a lot of really like you know data recommendations to work with um, um, so I think companies need to understand that it's not about bringing external people in immediately to talk to, you know, your employees. It's about looking internally about like, do you really understand what your baseline is? Like, even before changing anything, what is your absolute ground level right now? Like, what are the problems that absolutely exist that you want to change? And have you after understanding that baseline, after having a DNI strategy, after being agreeable in terms of what you're going to work with. Have you set the right types of goals to with, you know, the leaders within your org to really work to move the needle? Because without that, like without those goals, you really aren't going to be able to measure anything later on in terms of, you know, what improvements have been made and have you made the effort to consistently measure the results of, you know, from those goals that have been set and have you furthered that work that cont cont employees need to be able to see that continuous work, that continuous narrative and not just, you know, you standing up and talking about it during the quarterly or every six month all hands. So I think that is one very important thing your policies and procedures should reflect your overall commitment. And I think employees also observe where you stand on important issues externally. When you talk about your company, when you talk about your business, the language that you use, you know, the importance you place on building an inclusive culture within the company, that is very visible in the way you present yourself. So talk about it, be honest, be very transparent, and most importantly, be very authentic on where you stand on important issues, whether they are political or apolitical issues. Um, a success story that I'll share, this actually might sound like, <laughs> it was almost like a little game that me and two other people in the previous company I was working at decided to do, which ended up having quite a you know, solid impact and we were very excited about it. Um, I would also like to mention that the leaders that we spoke to to even try this out were very uh, excited about it and thought it was a creative way to do something and they were all very open-minded. So we were able to do this. Uh, we did this within the Seattle office because that office was just about, you know, 90 people. And uh, so we would be able to see the impact of it if we did this. So what we did is we formed a group called the Rainbow Rock Stars. Um, and <laughs> what we would do is basically do lunchtime skits. Uh, so when everyone's in the lunchroom having you know, their food and just generally relaxed, we would enact the stuff that was happening in the meetings, like in a very comic way, like, you know, being interrupted, being cut off, but, you know, you know, as a woman, me saying something, but another person saying something, the same thing and getting credit for that, we would do it in the most comical way possible. And then people would just laugh about it, 
finish their lunch and go off. But what we did notice is that people were getting more conscious of doing these kind of things in meetings. So since it was limited to the Seattle office, we could sit in in many of the meetings, of course, later in the week, and our colleagues could sit in these meetings. And they noticed change because people may, be, were more conscious because they, when they were about to do something that was presented in the skit, they immediately got, you know, like they were like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And they wouldn't do it. And so that brought about meaningful change. And it was a very grassroots level, very basic effort that we started, which grew on. And a lot of people joined this initiative and we were able to measure it. The reason I mentioned this as a success is not only was it bringing change, but it was measurable. I think companies sometimes try to build this huge comprehensive strategy for the entire company. And it would be much more impactful if they tried to focus on small pilot, collected, concentrated initiatives, and then replicated success across the org rather than do a one size fits all um, approach. On the side of um, a failed attempt at DNI um, that I feel um, happened, and I wasn't, it wasn't necessarily led by anybody specific, but one of the companies I worked at, what they tried to do is uh, position certain leaders within their leadership org as you know stalwarts of diversity and inclusion and like that they represent it that they talk about it that they go out there and like you know really advance the conversation however what they did what they did I feel wrong was picking the wrong leaders to do that because some of these leaders on one hand their teams were going through a lot of like you know issues of bias and discrimination and people not feeling like they're getting promoted like their colleagues and all, all of that stuff but at the same time the company is presenting them as leaders in diversity and inclusion and so it had a harmful effect rather than you know working in favor of what they were trying to do so you have to be very careful in who you choose to represent send these conversations within your company because people are sensitive to the actual actions as well. Thank you. Um, I am going, I'm going to ask uh, just one, one more question on this, this pre-planned chunk here and then I actually want to open it up for audience questions a little bit early. Athena, question for you. When you think about this challenge of really improving diversity and inclusion efforts within and across the different IEEE societies, if, if we could like look forward 10 years from now and say we were successful, what would look different? What would be different about how we work? Yes, so um, I would like to see that 50% of the members of uh, IEEE uh, are women. Um, that I would consider success. Uh, I would like to see women uh, getting recognized for their work, uh, getting uh, uh, awards as uh, same percentages as men. Um, so I would like to see where we get to a point where we don't need to discuss about uh, increasing the diversity of our technical committees. It comes uh, naturally. And uh, same for academia. I would like to see to see 50% of the faculty uh, being uh, uh, women or minorities, um, and same for our students. It's a long way to achieve that. As I said, some countries have achieved it for their undergraduate students, but uh, we need to uh, pursue the same at our graduates programs, at the faculty, at professional societies in order to see real change. In the in the society. Thank you. Can you all hear me? My computer seems to have decided to glitch. Everything is still okay. Wonderful. Um, Heather is going to host our open Q and A. So again, if you have questions for the panelists. Please feel free to ask general questions or you can um, call out a specific panelist in the, the group chat. And Heather, I will hand it over to you to moderate this portion of the session. Okay, great. Can you hear me all right, Keely? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, before we get to the panel questions, we have a couple so far. Um, I'm going to shamelessly um, do a, a little bit of promotion, um, if, if you don't mind. Um, we have uh, two, uh, two Twitter accounts. Um, one is called Sisters of SAR, SOS, 
and one is called Ladies of Landsat, LOL. Um, these are led by um, some pretty incredible uh, women. Um, so they are, you know, focused on many different things, promoting uh, science uh, and accomplishments in those, those fields of research. Um, but for example, Sisters of SAR, um, we have a, um, a Friday SAR star section where we promote um, an incredible uh, accomplished um, woman in, in the field of, of radar science um, every Friday. Um, so I just wanted to put a little plug for those two, those two groups. Um, I've been just amazed. I'm not really a Twitter person myself, but I've been absolutely amazed at the accomplishments um, in this field of science in general and some of the amazing accomplishments of women around the world um, that uh, I think we have um, something like more than 2000 followers within the first three months of operating. So, um, so okay, that's the, the end of the self-promotion. Um, so I, there, we have a first question from uh, Fabio and some of these questions were, were posted before the panelists um, uh, were able to, uh, uh, to answer some of Keeley's questions, but I'll, I'll pose them um, and if you have additional things you wanna add. So the first one is for um, Athena. Uh, so the question from Fabio is um, if, if you have any comments that you would like to add to beyond what you've already said in terms of how to make IEEE more diverse and inclusive. Um, and in particular, the question um, talks about GRSS and the Signal Processing Society. So if you have any comments about how those two societies um, or other societies under IEEE how they might be able to work together for diversity and inclusiveness. So Athena? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, I, I feel that the recruitment is the key in improving our diversity. We need to bring in a new blood and we need to create a nice story for K-12 students uh, so that they decide to come to electrical engineering and then um, We'll take it from there. Um, regarding working together be, uh, between the GRSS and signal processing societies, um, I think there's a lot of potential because signal processing um, researchers produce tools that you use for earth observation, for climate observations and so on. So there is a natural synergy and it would be fantastic if we can team up and address students together and uh, recruit um, together. Or we can uh, share uh, best practices in our efforts to improve diversity. I'm really impressed with uh, what I heard from you with the micro grants and the columns in the, your magazines and the podcast. I mean, these are fantastic uh, uh, opportunities and uh, definitely we can uh, do something together and uh, um, it, enhance our efforts to improve diversity. That's great, thank you. And, and you know, the IDEA team is a, a small and mighty team, I would say. Um, and Sean did a great job of providing uh, a list of all of the accomplishments, but, um, you know, uh, working together would be really helpful in terms of, um, you know, uh, putting our, our heads together as well as our resources together to, uh, you know, to work towards some of these goals. So that would be that would be fabulous um, and we were really excited to have our sister organization join us today um, so we have uh, another question here um, from Shanak and the question um, is for all of all of the panelists so we'll maybe we'll start with uh, Nisha and, and then work down um, from there uh, so the question, this is kind of an interesting question because we have some fabulous women leaders um, as, our, as our panelists, but this question is um, for those who may not be leaders in their companies, but are interested in convincing leaders um, that moving um, to move in the right, right direction with respect to diversity and inclusiveness. So for those who are, you know, earlier in their careers or maybe aren't, um, you know, at the, uh, uh, you know, leaders in their organizations yet. Um, if the, if you have any pointers or talking points that you might suggest uh, for that uh, part of the organization. Um, so those, those earlier in their careers to help move uh, diversity inclusiveness forward. 
So Nisha, maybe I'll ask you and then Christine and then Athena last. Sounds good. Thank you, Heather. And thank you, Shauna, for the question. Um, one thing I've noticed is a, as an effective way, like, you know, when you're not necessarily a leader by job description in an organization, um, is to work with other people who are, you know, director level or like basically considered leaders within the organization to to basically voice your message and your needs and things like that. I feel like that's sometimes been effective because um, they have already built that relationship where they have brought proposals and ideas to the main, you know, the highest level of leadership within the company and they have already built that influence. So that could be a great pathway to approach important conversations like that. Have an ally who will work with you to present your thoughts. Um, and the other thing is uh, it's, as much at, at the end of the day, most companies are businesses. They're there uh, to make money as well. So try to tie your ideas to outcomes, whether that's internal outcomes that can improve like, you know, company retention, bring more uh, diverse people with into the company and like improve the brand image overall, or, you know, directly tie it to the bottom line, whatever it may be. Present your ideas with an outcome in mind that the leadership team that you're presenting to or passing the idea to can say six months from now, yes, we did this and look at where it got us because that can get them interested much quicker than if you came up with something that was too ambiguous to really understand or measure. That those, those are two things I would recommend. That's excellent. Uh, Christine? Um, yeah, I, I, Nisha took some of my thoughts. So, um, uh, but, and I 100% agree in having, finding that sympathetic leader, I call it, you know, the person who is pa passionate and the right leader will, uh, that will listen to your ideas um, is also very, very uh, important. Um, I would also add that I think the first thing is you've got to walk the talk in your own group as much as you possibly can and, um, and prove that you you live and breathe your views and the changes that you'd like to happen every single day and with that they will see your passion and it won't come sometimes if you don't do that it comes across as complaining rather than trying to advance and broaden what you're doing in your own group to others um, and finally i would say we have a global economy um, we have multicultural world certainly canada is very much multicultural uh, we know that you know, we're not going to have the same um, societal makeup five years from now, even what we have today. And I think going back to that cell point is we need to have a representative population in our organization so that we can understand how to sell a product, how to market our product. And we've got all of those ideas from all the different perspectives that allow us to be successful. And finally, I would add, um, what we're seeing right now, too, is that social conscience. People are going to uh, work for different organizations because of their social conscience. I mean, Starbucks, the Starbucks example was a really, really good one when they uh, wouldn't allow the, the um, black person into their, um, into Starbucks. And they shut down, trained everybody and then open back up again. And I think that you don't want to be losing talent because you don't have the social conscience and you don't have an organization that embraces diversity. That's it. Thank you, Christina. Dina? Yes, so um, the people before me already uh, brought up very valid points. I mean, uh, if we want to serve a market that uh, consists of 50% women at least, then we better have uh, female representation in our companies in order to better serve them because who understands better their needs. Um, and we should be talking not only about women. I mean, there is also LGBT, LGBTQ people who uh, are underrepresented and they also uh, need to be uh, served. Um, before going and talking to the leader and convincing them, I think we need to uh, do groundwork and talk to other people around us and create sympathizers. 
And we can do that by uh, involving people to the various uh, activities that promote diversity. Because even if they don't believe in it, if they get involved, they see the value um, and uh, they become your allies. And if you have like a, a, a large group of people supporting your cause, it's easier to convince the leader that this is the right uh, way to go. And we should, uh, we need to involve uh, also men, white male in our activities and uh, uh, get their support uh, that will make us more effective. Thank you. So we have, we have one more question, but if anybody else uh, has any questions, please pose them to the chat uh, room. So this one is from Jessica. Um, and it's not directed to anyone in particular, so I might go through um, again. Maybe, um, uh, Christine, we could start with you and then um, uh, Nisha and um, Athena. Uh, so the question is uh, a bit more specific, but you could open up the, your, your comments um, if, if you like. But the, the question as posed is, are there support or mentorship opportunities to retain existing graduate students in the field. So um, I, I think you could think of that broadly and not just graduate students, but just to, you know, how do we support and mentor to keep and retain, um, you know, diverse workforces. So if you have any specific or general ideas behind that, that would be fabulous. Um, Christine, can we start with you? Um, I think that one of the key success factors of any diversity and inclusion program really has to give space and opportunities for um, people to talk and take time to have those conversations and have those conversations in a safe space. And I think whether it is for uh, graduate students or it's, it's for others, I think having somebody to talk with, whether they're a mentor or they're just a colleague, um, is, is important. And because if they don't have anybody to talk to, they could leave without you even knowing it. The second thing, so that's what I would say. I would just say that you need that safe space and you have to have a way to create that safe space to talk. And if that's a mentoring programs is one way of doing that. Thank you. So Anisha, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you, Heather. Um, I think um, the other thing is like in order to continue to retain diversity within the you know, pool of candidates that's available from graduate programs coming out, we need to champion initiatives that um, policies that affect um, you know, people of color and women differently than men, whether that's, you know, working moms in the workforce uh, who are now dealing with, of course, taking care of the family and children along with like being on remote calls all day um, or people of color. And like, you know, they have um, like, you know, during COVID, they're suffering in terms of like their families and not being able to travel to them and all this stuff. So like policies need to be built in to take care of them so that people feel like they can survive different situations as they get into the workforce. I think that'll encourage people to stay um, in, you know, technical, non-technical fields and everything like that more when they know they have support systems later to help them succeed. Um, and the other thing, as Christine pointed out really well, is help give them the safe spaces to have conversations consistently about the things that affect them. Um, not just, you know, when there's a top hot news item out there on TV, but consistently build those safe spaces for them, not in large groups, but individual safe spaces where they can feel heard and supported and policies can continue to transform based on their feedback. Thank you so much, uh, Athena. Yes, so safe spaces and mentoring are uh, very important. We need to show um, diversity students and faculty that their spe the specific needs are addressed. Uh, for example, at Rutgers, we started a lactation room for female uh, students and faculty. Uh, we didn't have one before and it, it was uh, used uh, widely. Um, we also started a training uh, a workshop for uh, teaching assistants on how to deal with LGBTQ students because we get students, uh, teaching assistants from all over the world who may not be exposed to how 
uh, you address uh, an LB LGBTQ person. So this was very important uh, training and you could see that it was very tough for this uh, teaching assistance in the beginning, but it had to be done. Um, in addition to mentoring and creating safe space, financial uh, support is very important for the students to remain in the program and uh, scholarships uh, are very important and we can partner with uh, companies and industry in uh, securing uh, such scholarships because they also have to benefit if uh, uh, students remain in the program and they graduate. I mean, they will find the better uh, qualified employees. Thank you very much. So that's the end of our, our chat questions. Before I hand it back to, to Keely, um, I just want to put another plug in. I'm a huge supporter of, of mentoring programs. Um, you know, words of encouragement uh, can be hugely important and we can pro all probably think back to times when somebody said something to us at the right time in the right place in our careers that that really uh, was comforting and, and helpful to us. And a little bit more of a plug for our podcast. So Sean mentioned that in his introduction. So we are running, we will be running eight podcasts this uh, that will be completed by the end of uh, December which will uh, celebrate um, actually nine incredible women in our field of science um, and to encourage, uh, you know, anyone in the GRSS uh, community to, uh, to sign up for our mentoring program. So um, do, uh, uh, do keep your eye out for those, uh, for those podcasts. And um, this is a more formal mentoring program, of course, but, um, uh, it's it's a great initiative, and I think it's really important. So um, uh, I we won't close the the chat uh, just yet, Keely. I guess, but I'll hand it over to you. Heather, I, I have a, a question um, that we, that would be great to hear each panelist address, uh, and and I think kind of would be a nice one to sort of sum up all of the advice and experience that you shared, and that's what types of DNI initiatives do you really believe one have the greatest chance of being successful and or the most meaningful long-term impact and and why why that particular initiative or that particular style of initiative would have a great chance of success or would definitely have meaningful long-term impact uh, you can mix it up a little bit athena you want to go for some of this Yes, so I, I strongly believe that uh, we need to strengthen the presence of women and minorities at faculty positions uh, because uh, they have the power to convince students to act as role models to students to um, inspire them to pursue excellence and pursue leadership positions when they graduate. So increasing the numbers of diversity on the faculty is really important uh, around the world. Uh, Christine? Um, I 100% agree with Athena. Having that uh, diversity in your organization all the way to the top, all the way to the top and showing that diversity matters and you can have a career at that or in that organization um, because you see diversity all the way through. Um, I also think the greatest chance of success is, is involvement of the communities, whether it be women in science, which I would say is one of the most active communities we networks that we have at uh, AAFC. Um, that is absolutely crucial. Two, allowing the people to have the time to be able to have the involvement. In many cases, you'll have a, they'll have a full-time job, um, but how can we make it work for them? Can we get them the support to be able to be active and, and, and promote uh, their, their agenda. Um, I would say the other thing is giving them the communication tools that they need to be able to communicate out. And um, one of the challenges we're seeing with our networks is we don't have enough communications employees supporting them um, just because there's so many other things going on in the organization. And I would think just 
very similar to a question that was asked in the chat room, uh, find the leaders to support it and the, and Nisha, you said it, and the right leaders, the leaders that are going to walk the talk. And, and if you don't do that, yeah, um, I really completely agree with Nisha, then you're really a talking head rather than somebody who's living and breathing it and wants it to change. Can't hear you. Just let me know. All right. Can you hear me okay now? Okay. Yes. Perfect. That was muted again. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree with what Athena and Christine uh, said as well. I think it is really important to, you know, when you're designing policies or processes within the company, uh, try to make sure that it's not just your leadership team, immediate leadership team that's drafting these policies, bring more people to the table, bring diverse people to the table to re review these policies and see how it affects them so that you have that sounding board in advance before you implement things that can, you know, be a success or a disaster um, in many cases. The other thing is, um, I would go back to something I said previously, is that don't think of this huge comprehensive strategy. Think small. Think of making impactful changes to small sections of the company or organization and then learning from it and replicating that change because over time those will become the big meaningful changes um, in the company. And totally agree with what Athena said. Like I think success would one day look like you know more representation on the table, whether that's 50% women plus people of color and everything. Like it should look like what predictions say America is going to look like in 20 years, we're going to be more diverse than just white. So I think companies need to move that move at that pace as well. Great. Thank you all. Um, I, I will use just a, a couple of our last minutes here uh, to finish up. Oh, wait, we have one, one more Q&A coming in. Sean, would you like to ask your question? Sean has a question about being a good ally. So, um, so, so what are things as, as an old white guy that, that I can do to be a, a better ally? Um, I guess, well, what do you, what do you see as, as, um, as uh, characteristics of good allies? I can answer this if you want. So it's, it's very important to uh, have uh, white uh, men as allies. So in that uh, activity that I'm doing, the progress uh, workshop, I have a committee of about 20 uh, faculty from all over the world and over half of them are, are men. And they're very influential uh, men uh, who uh, also want to work towards improving diversity because they see the value in doing that. So. Uh, we need uh, your help in order to uh, bring out the message and uh, a good allies, I think you need to listen and not uh, volunteer solutions. Uh, the solutions should come organically from the people who uh, are, have the experiences and face the problems. Um, so if uh, white men have a good ear um, and they can uh, be more helpful in uh, uh, promoting diversity. Um, thank you, Athena. I would like to add a few points to Sean if we have a few minutes. Okay. Um, so Sean, what I would say is, you know, based on the different types of allies I've had in the org, it's like if you're an ally to somebody, be as authentic and transparent as you can, um, talk them up in every opportunity you can, uh, whether that's in meeting, whether that's in promotional discussions, whether um, that's you know actively engaging and stopping any bias that's happening towards them. So they feel empowered and know you are um, on their side and are advocating for them. And if you are in more conversations than they are where they are talked about or work that they have done is being talked about, make sure that they are being given credit for what they have done and contributed to the organization because sometimes you can be a great ally, you can be a good sounding board, but if you're not advocating for them, then it only goes so far in helping advance them. So if you can do that, always do that. Um, I have um, 
completely agree with uh, um, Nisha and Athena. And I would say one of the most interesting moments I've had as a champion for women, and it was at CBSA. We had a room full of women and uh, a, whole bunch, a whole crew on the video conference. And, um, and a young white male joined and everybody kind of kind of looked at him. And I'll never forget, he said, I learned so much about the challenges that women are having by attending that meeting. And, and I thought that that was a really powerful moment for everybody around the table. That, so that might be, you know, not everybody would be comfortable with that, but he was. Um, and uh, just allow when you, if you're having or ask, could I participate in some of these sessions? and become an ally and, and, and in that way. So you can understand and hear what the, the challenges are. Thanks all. Um, all right, we've got just a few minutes left. I'm gonna close this out. I wanna give a great big thank you to all three of our amazing panelists. It was really, really wonderful. We so very much appreciate the time you took to prepare and joining us here today to lead these conversations. Uh, I know I took copious notes and our idea committee will have lots to work through just, just from the learnings of our discussion today and looking forward to following up with each of you. Uh, I hope if you're in the audience that you also got a lot of out of the discussion, uh, learned some new things, maybe are taking some ideas back to the different organizations that you're part of and if you're part of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society or part of another IEEE society, that you can really help us build this change from the bottom up in the society. I will give uh, a plug for our second IGERS tie track event, which will be next Thursday on October 29th. And we're having a uh, co-hosted event with Women in Science and Engineering for the Environment, YZ, and that is our inspire and empower panel where we will actually have a, um, a really nice moderated conversation with five women active in geoscience and remote sensing from across the globe. Uh, we got almost complete global coverage this year with that panel. Uh, and so that's on the IEEE website. There's registration links, I encourage you to join. And if you want to participate in our women in geoscience inspire us photo contest, uh, you can Submit a picture of yourself doing something cool in geoscience and remote sensing. And um, we'll actually be announcing the finalists and the winners of that in our event next Thursday. Heather and Sean, anything that I've forgotten that we, we should include in our wrap up here? No, I'm, I'm good. Just to thank everyone for participating, posting your questions for our panelists and, and everyone who joined us today. Thanks everyone for making it a great success. All right, thank you all very much.